The COVID crisis has gone on for two long years now, and we're all facing COVID fatigue. But it's important we remain vigilant. Infectious diseases pediatrician Dr. Allison Bartlett and community health expert Dr. Doreen Miller will discuss the COVID-19 Omicron variant and what makes it unique, what you should know about kids and vaccines, how to understand COVID-19 tests, and what it means if you're vaccinated and test positive, plus a whole lot more. And they'll take your questions. That's coming up right now on At The Forefront Live. And we want to remind our viewers that today's program is not designed to take the place of a visit with your physician. We're going to start off with having each one of you introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about yourselves. You've both been on this program multiple times, but we do have viewers probably joining us for the first time. Dr. Bartlett, you are at the desk, so we will start with you today. Thank you. It's great to be here again. Uh, I'm Dr. Allison Bartlett. I'm a pediatric infectious diseases physician, and I'm also uh, part of our infection prevention and control team here at the hospital. Fantastic. Dr. Miller? Hello, I'm Dr. Dorian Miller. I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Chicago. I'm also the director of the Center for Community Health and Vitality. Great. So we do want to remind our viewers that we will take questions. So if you type them in the comment section, uh, we'll get to as many as possible uh, during the course of the program. So, so start typing away. I'm sure we'll, we'll have quite a few as we move through the show today. So let's just start off and talk a little bit about the Omicron variant of, of COVID-19. We've heard a lot about it. Um, and, and, and I think um, a lot of folks think it's not as serious possibly as, as uh, uh, Delta, but it is still very serious and it's something we need to be, be aware of and be vigilant about, correct? A absolutely, you know, I think there's been two components to this pandemic the entire time. There is the individual health component and the public health component of this. And sometimes those are a little bit at odds with each other. It looks like for each individual, the Omicron infection may not be as severe as others. But on a public health scale, the fact that it is so incredibly easy to spread from person to person, it's having a very significant impact on the public health. I think interestingly in kids, we're also seeing symptoms are a little bit different and a lot more kids are having uh, upper airway problems are more like a croup that we would see with other viral infections. And these are things that kind of hang around for, for, for a while, uh, don't they? they? They can, and they can you know, lead to the, the foremost of long COVID uh, syndrome, but also just a lingering cough uh, or other impacts. Dr. Miller, talk to us a little bit about, if you will, the kind of the community impact. I know part of what, what you've done, your work, is to try to get the word out on how important the, the vaccine uh, vaccines are. And, and, and I know that's been a bit of a struggle at times. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and where we stand now and, and what are our continuing efforts to, to get the, the positive word out? We've been working very effectively through the Chicagoland Vaccine Partnership, um, which is a coalition of academic health centers, community-based organizations, public health entities, as well as philanthropy, in order to provide messaging to get the word out about the importance of getting vaccinated. But one of the things that we see, and we see these statistics come up week by week, is that between the ages of 18 and 45, particularly in the African-American community, that vaccination rates are still very, very low. And, and what are you hearing from your patients? Uh, we, we were talking a little bit before the show uh, about some of the hesitancy. Um, can you tell us what people are expressing to you and, and, and what do you tell them? Because I think we all need tips here. You know, about a year ago, my patients were a little bit more forthcoming about uh, their hesitancy in getting vaccinated um, in terms of uh, how long the vaccines have been available, uh, questions about research, et cetera. But it seems that these days, and I'm thinking about the past six months or so, that my patients are, are not sharing as much information with me around why they are hesitant to get the vaccine. I will say that for the patients I see that are 45 to 65, there's been a little bit more of a shift in terms of people now um, getting the vaccine. My patients over 65 have always been, Dr. Miller, when can I get this vaccine? <laughs> Literally, when it was available in December of 2020, all of the phone calls and email messages that I received 
put me on the list, put me on the list. But for the younger populations, there was some hesitancy because they thought, well, this is only going to be a bad flu, I'll get through it, I'll be fine. Or questions about the, the, the research and the, the uh, rapid way in which the vaccine was developed. Um, early on, I was able to get that 45 to 65 year old group to um, think a little bit more about getting it. But I have to say that for the patients that I care for at the University of Chicago, many of whom come to an academic health center because they have lots and lots of illnesses that require fairly intensive management, they've been the people who have suffered. Um, they've suffered with hospitalizations. I've had patients that have unfortunately uh, passed away from complications of COVID. And I'm not talking about 70 or 80 year olds. I'm talking about people in their 30s and 40s. You know, I think that's maybe a time in, in people's lives where you think that you're, you're bulletproof, I guess you could say. I mean, I, I remember as I've gotten older and maybe a little wiser, um, I've realized that there are things that, that, that I thought that wouldn't impact me that actually do. And I, I wonder if that's, that's part of the situation there, because you mentioned that, that older group, the, you know, the, the folks that are 65 and plus and maybe a little bit more mature and realize that they have to, have to be a little more careful. I think that does have an impact. I think it does have an impact, but I also think that there have been other impacts on how people receive information yeah. and also how they judge the credibility of information. Mm -hmm. And so many of my patients who are in that 18 to 45 category oftentimes will look to social media as a way of doing research um, on uh, COVID-19, um, vaccines, etc. And so the question of who's telling them the truth um, what is the evidence base behind it? And how do you sort through that information? Um, I think is something that's been challenging during this time of, of increased social media uptake. You know, that's, I, I, you hit the nail on the head right there. I think that's probably the most critical aspect to this is, is social media, where people get their, their information and, and what they believe anymore. And that's, unfortunately, it's just a, it's a, we're in a kind of a sad spiral, yeah. I think, in that area, which is too bad. Uh, we do have some questions coming in from viewers, and I promise to get to as many as possible. Uh, so I'll, I'll throw this one out there. And, and, and Dr. Bartlett, let's, let's go with, to you with this one. This is from Kat. Um, will we have to get another vaccine to prevent uh, against future mutations? I suspect, yes, there are, there are additional COVID vaccines in our future. Now, is it going to be uh, a dose that's specifically tailored to a mutation that we have not yet encountered, or it's going to be sort of an annual booster like the flu or every 10 years like our tetanus boosters. I don't think we know that piece yet. Um, but I think that even for those of us who've gotten our two doses and our booster, we are not, we are not done with COVID vaccines. Yeah. That said, for the moment, those two doses and booster are incredibly protective. Well, and, and the thing we have to remember with this is when people get worried about getting another vaccine, the vaccines that we've seen so far have gone out to millions of people with, with very little uh, negative impact. So it's not like this ha This hasn't been tested. Um, it, it has. I would only correct you and say it's billions with a B <laughs> and not millions with an F. Yes. Yeah. So it's probably the safest vaccine uh, in history, I would imagine. I mean, just from when you look at sheer numbers. Uh, both the amount of doses that have been given and the rigor with which we've been following people who've been vaccinated are unprecedented. Yeah. Another question from a viewer, this is from Allie. What precautions should people who are vaccinated and boosted still be taking? Is it safe to eat in a restaurant, for example, or to go see a movie? What about vaccinated people with certain high-risk conditions, uh, such as pregnancy? And, I, you know, again, I, I think this kind of goes towards the, the question about normalcy and lives, and, and we all want to get back to, to that, that some sense of normalcy, I guess. So I don't know, Dr. Miller, if you want to start us on this one? You know, I, I think that being able to assess one's risk of getting a COVID-19 infection, whether it be if you're unvaccinated, certainly you need to take proper precautions in terms of um, masking up, washing up, and backing up, which is the, um, uh, the, the phrases that I use in order to remind my patients exactly what to do. But when you think about being in special categories, for instance, we see lots of people who are under 
undergoing treatment for cancer that may not have had a full response to even the first series, two series um, for the ones that we have here at University of Chicago and a booster, that they're still going to be at higher risk for getting a COVID-19 infection. And so uh, talking to your doctor, your healthcare provider about what your personal risk is, and then deciding how much you want to engage in some of the things that prior to um, March 2019, or 2020 rather, we would consider to be normal. Um, certainly risks are much lower in terms of people getting infections or having breakthrough infections if they've been fully vaccinated and boosted. We still see some of these in some people, but one of the things that we know is that these infections tend to be milder in that they are not landing people in the hospital and they're not dying from the infections. And that's what the vaccines were made for, to prevent death and hospitalization. Yeah, I think that's a common misconception because you, we hear all the time that people say, well, my, my friend got it and they were vaccinated, doesn't work. And that's, that's not the case. Um, one of the questions that, that I've, I've been kind of curious about because there's been a lot of debate about this, if, if you do test positive or if you're if you, you have symptoms for COVID, when is it appropriate to actually go see your physician? Is it, uh, you know, because I know most of the hospitals are very busy um, and so people may tend to shy away from doing that and, and I don't know who wants to take that one. I'm happy to start with that one. Sure. I think there's two reasons to go see your physician. One is clearly if your symptoms are severe and you think that may be a need to be admitted to the hospital because you're going to need oxygen support and um, are having difficulty breathing. But the other is if you are in one of these high risk uh, groups for having severe disease, we have treatment that we can give very early on in infection that can help keep you out of the hospital. Right? And so that is really when it's important to say, gosh, are the symptoms I'm having right now possibly COVID infection? And if you have access to a rapid test at home, great. If not, you know, seek testing quickly, and then know that you know University of Chicago and other places have treatment for individuals in these high-risk groups that we can connect you with quickly, and hopefully keep your mild to moderate infection mild to moderate and keep you out of the hospital. You know, we've heard some uh, in the news about some of the treatments that have been made available and a pill that was uh, coming out. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and describe what what that is and what it does? Sure, there are several different treatments that are out there. Uh, one is indeed a pill. There's actually two different medications in pill form. One seems to be more effective than the other called Paxlovid. And uh, it is available for adults who have, again, these high risk conditions. We don't have as much of it out as we would like. I, in the future, I suspect we'll be using a lot more of this uh, to uh, give people with early infections. There is another medication called remdesivir that we've been using in the hospital quite um, uh, regularly that if you give a course very early on in the infection, again, it can prevent, prevent, prevent progression. Uh, and then there also is a monoclonal antibody therapy that can be given as well. Great. Mm -hmm. So we do have some more questions coming in from viewers, so let's try to get to those. Uh, this is an interesting one from Al. With masking mandates dropping in schools, for example, does that signal that the pandemic is coming to an end? If so, will the motivation to get uh, vaccinated uh, start to wane, which I think could be a bit of a problem and I'll, either one of you can, can take that one. The ruling that just came out of uh, Southern Illinois around masking had more to do with the issue of who has domain over making the decisions rather than being related to the public health issue. Yeah. And that's something that I think people may not understand. And so Al asked a very good question around this, uh, but this did not come from our public health leadership within the state nor the governor. Dr. Bartlett? I'll take a wild guess. Our yeah. public health leadership would like to see masking continue, yeah. I would imagine. I mean, ultimately, we would all like to be done with this, right? Yeah. And, and I think that is it's true for me and my family as well. Uh, but just because we want it to be done doesn't mean that it's done. Uh, and when I think about the impact of the public health measures and the risk and benefit of you know, masking in schools, the risk is very minimal and the benefit to our students and their vulnerable family members at home and our teachers and the school staff, um, the upside is just so great. And I, I really do hope that the vaccination uh, hesitancy does not does not uh, fall as we lose. Sorry, 
Yeah. You know, we, we, we're getting great questions from viewers, so keep them coming. Here's another one that I think is, is an important question. This is from Jade. How much confidence should folks uh, have with rapid tests? Uh, you know, and, and should people be swazzing, swabbing their throat as well as their nose? And this has been, uh, there's been a lot of controversy about rapid tests. Uh, you know, if, uh, from what I understand, if, if it tests positive, you are positive. But if it tests negative, eh, maybe. Um, so your thoughts on rapid tests and how good they are? I think just that. They, they are often very useful if you have access to them, uh, which hopefully is starting to increase a little bit since we can now get them uh, from the uh, government. But if you are symptomatic and you test positive, that's easy. You are positive you have COVID. Uh, if you test negative, you're correct that it could be too early in the disease or um, not enough uh, virus there to test positive. So it's not as reassuring that you don't have the COVID illness. Interesting. It's negative. So this one is from Dale. Uh, Dale wants to know if uh, not having a thymus as an adult affects efficacy of the vax and boosters. Don't know who wants to take that one. Uh, so certainly there are uh, parts of the immune system that don't work quite as well um, if you don't have a thymus. We talk a lot about how much antibody protection a vaccine gives you. And that is an important part of the immune response, but there are a lot of other parts to an immune response uh, generated by a vaccine. Uh, and so um, we, don't, we can't measure those as well, so I think that there is still um, good protection and absolutely would be vaccinated, but I think would also continue to be cautious and do the other measures to keep myself safe. Sure. Can we talk a little bit about um, COVID vaccines in children? Because the ages have changed a little bit. We've, we've seen that it's been opened up uh, more and, and continues to. And I don't know if, if, if either one of you wants to tackle this one, but talk to us a little bit about COVID-19 vaccines for the children, uh, what you're seeing coming and, and kind of what you hope to see. As the pediatrician, I will uh, help out with this one. Sure. Uh, so yes, we do have a vaccination approval for children ages five and up. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in Chicago, we're doing a little bit better in terms of our rates compared with other parts of the country, but we're still at about one third of kids in that age range are vaccinated, which again is significantly less than we would like. There's been a lot of controversy of late and buzz about what to do with a six-month-old to five-year-old group. Um, you know, the initial very low dose that was chosen for the Pfizer vaccine didn't look like it gave a great antibody response. Uh, and there's work to make this into a three-dose series. Uh, and then there was a bunch of press about how we're going to go ahead and maybe get authorization for our two-dose series uh, anyway. And I think people are finding that confusing what happened, what's new, what's different. And I, I think a couple things are at play and we'll know more Friday when this gets presented to the FDA. Um, one thing is this being a three dose series for kids is not surprising. It's frankly a three dose series for us. We just talked yeah. about how important it was to get your two doses and your booster. It's every other vaccine we give little kids, um, their you know, tetanus shots and their polio vaccines are all multiple dose series. So this is not a surprise. And if it really is that third dose that makes a difference, the only way to get to the third dose is by giving doses one and two first. I think we also are gonna benefit from the real world experiment of the Omicron surge. Mm -hmm. um, when we were doing vaccine studies back in the fall, there was not much COVID around and we had to use antibody response as our benchmark to see if this vaccine works. Well, in January, we've had a month of incredibly high rates of infections and we can actually show the vaccine protected these kids against infection. So I'm really excited for that six month to uh, four year old age group to finally get some protection, give their parents some peace of mind because it's been such a stressful time for those parents. Yeah. Tim, if I could just add Absolutely. one thing uh, about that rate of one third of children being vaccinated within the Chicago area to remember that for particularly for the Latinx and the African American communities that those rates are significantly yeah. lower than one third. And so the question of having a reservoir of infection that can uh, infect other members of the family is also something that's very important to know. So, Dr. Miller, can you talk to us a little bit about kind of what you've seen with, with patients as far as the, the long, we've heard about long haulers and this, mm -hmm. the long haul uh, symptoms that, that people um, seem to have and, and, and what can we do to help folks like that? 
Well, one of the things that we have at University of Chicago is that we actually have a clinic where people who have long haul COVID syndrome are being seen, um, not just by adult general internist like myself, but also specialty physicians as well. In terms of what I've seen clinically for patients that have long haul COVID, I've seen people that have a lot of fatigue, um, exhaustion after doing just simple activities at home, rapid heart rates associated with it, and also for some of my older patients I've noticed changes in their mental status um, in that people who uh, are in their 60s and 70s suddenly having difficulty with remembering things and a few si signs and symptoms that might indicate that they may be having some problems with what's called mild cognitive impairment, which is the step that can come before someone develops dementia. So again, these are symptoms that I've observed in some of my clinic patients. Have we seen much in, in, as far as depression? For some patients, yes, I've seen depression as well. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's the, the terrible thing. I mean, lots of terrible things about this disease, but that's one of them, is just these, these cognitive effects that, that you just described mm -hmm. that I don't think probably most people saw coming, I, I would imagine. Um, no, I, I think you're right. I think that there are a lot of unknowns. You know, is long COVID permanent? You know, it, it's too soon to tell. Is it going to be more common with the Omicron variant? We don't know. It's too soon to tell. And I think that we were appropriately focused on acute COVID right away, right? And now we are seeing uh, significant impacts outside of just the acute infection. Another question from a viewer, this is from Amelia, who wonders, wants to talk about cloth masks. Um, there's a lot of debate on cloth versus paper masks and different mask types. A lot of folks say that the cloth masks don't work as well. So her question is, why do we continue to use them? Oh. Something's better than nothing. One, but there actually have been studies that have been done to look at the possibility of transmission using cloth versus three-layer surgical versus the N95, KN95, and a number, another one that's called the 94 mask, depending upon where um, the masks are, are manufactured. Um, I believe for a cloth mask, it's about two hours. Is that right, Dr. Bartlett? Yeah, yeah I, I don't remember the official yeah. details, but it, 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 it is mm -hmm. helpful. Yeah. But it's helpful. It's helpful. But in terms of having additional protection against transmission, um, better to have the three-layer surgical mask, but also the KN95s or the N95s that are being sold uh, provide you with much longer and stronger protection. And, and I think there is some, some question, too, even as to what the purpose is of the mask, because it's really it's twofold. It does uh, afford you some protection, but, and, and, and this is what of the, kind of the way I've described it to folks before, I hope I'm right. Um, you know, if, if you go into surgery, the surgeons are wearing masks not so much to protect them, but to protect you in case, you know, they cough or something like that. So it's, it's, it's it, if you're wearing a mask, you're protecting other people. And I think that's lost uh, a lot of times. I think it is, and I really think that that is the major impact of masks. And that component of sort of protecting others around you, that's where a cloth mask Right, that stops the droplets can be sort of very effective. Um, it's less effective at protecting yourself. Um, and so again, the mask that you wear is the best mask <laughs> to wear, um, and a very poorly fitting surgical mask or a surgical mask that you're not wearing over your nose right, is not as good as a, a cloth mask that you're willing yeah. to wear. Another question from a viewer, this is from Sue. We, we discussed this a little bit earlier, but I think it's important enough that we probably could talk a little bit more about it. Uh, do we need another booster after the third booster? And there is actually a difference between a booster and just another vaccine. So that's, that's another area I think that sometimes people get a little confused, but uh, and I'll, I'll open that up to both of you. Perhaps um, we were, are looking at the data of people who have been boosted. We're looking at reinfection rates to see if there's a need. And um, I think one of the, the countries has been actually at the forefront of this and that we look at their data quite closely is Israel mm -hmm. in terms of how they have looked at uh, both doing the third vaccination or the booster and whether or not there's need for a fourth one. And so, again, we're not only looking at U.S. data, but we're looking at data from around the world with this we touched on this a little bit earlier, uh, Dr. Bartlett, but can you tell, talk to us about a PCR test versus a rapid test and just the, the differences from a, a technical standpoint? Because clearly there are 
our differences. Sure, so a, a PCR test is actually looking for the genetic material, the RNA of the virus itself, generally in either your nose or your nasopharynx, which is just farther back in your nose. Um, and the good things about that test is it can detect a really, really, really small amount of genetic material, which is helpful when you're trying to make the diagnosis, but we also know that once you have recovered from the virus and you're feeling better, some of that um, genetic material can stay behind and we can still detect it after weeks. Uh, and it's not actually uh, an infection that you could spread to somebody else. On the flip side, uh, the rapid tests look for some of the virus particle protein itself. And uh, you tend to need more of the virus there for the test to be positive, which is sometimes why it can, we worry about the false negative uh, tests. Interesting. Dr. Miller, you talked a little bit about long hauler symptoms earlier. Can you tell us if there's a difference between Omicron versus other variants as far as the long hauler symptoms? We actually don't know yet um, whether or not there will be more people who have long hauler symptoms versus not. And also sometimes people who have quote unquote mild infections with COVID actually go on to have long hauler symptoms. And so the data is still out on that and we're continuing to follow people over time. And I imagine this is something that for years to come we'll probably um, see impacts and, 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 and do studies. Um, so, so what is different for people who test positive versus people who are vaccinated? Because again, I think that's an area where people say, well, I got it, I got better, I don't need the vaccine. So again, the vaccine is meant to protect you against getting a severe infection or ending up in the hospital. Or in the case of children, it protects you against MISC or the multi-system inflammatory syndrome that you can get after a COVID infection. And so people with COVID, even though they've been vaccinated, are much less likely to get very ill. They can still transmit it to other people, so they need to be careful and you know, um, do their appropriate isolation. Uh, but that it really is the individual protection against severe illness that we're looking for. Dr. Miller, we're about out of time, but I, I think this is important. So uh, if, if you can give us some advice to, to parents and families that have hesitancy when it comes to the vaccine, what, what would you tell them? It's safe, it's effective, and it's a way to not only protect yourself, but also to protect the loved ones in your family by getting vaccinated. And Dr. Bartlett, any closing thoughts for us? I think that that's so true. It, it has been discouraging to see the amount of, frankly, selfishness um, going on. Um, there are individual components to this pandemic, and there are public health and community components to this um, pandemic and so I think we need to continue to focus on uh, how we can all benefit the community health as well. Are we getting closer do you think to being done? I think we'd be even closer if we had more people wearing masks and more people vaccinated. Yeah. All right so there's good advice right there wear your mask get vaccinated um, it, it's certainly something we should all do and and again and I've said this many times I, I, I know that you as physicians, the two of you know how important this is and believe in it, you've done it yourselves. You've both been vaccinated, I've been vaccinated, and you've certainly had your family members vaccinated. So if, if folks think that there is something going on that, that they shouldn't do it, there's pretty good proof because I've, I've seen plenty of physicians in our uh, hospital, I, I witnessed it with my own eyes, get the vaccine. So um, I think that should be pretty good, pretty good news and, and, and encourage people to do that. We are out of time. Thanks both of you for being on. You were fantastic as always. Big thank you to those of you who participated in the program. Very good questions today. Please remember to check out our Facebook page for a schedule of programs coming up in the future. And to make an appointment, you can go to uchicagomedicine.org or call 888-824-0200. Thanks again for being with us today and I hope everyone has a great week.